Can you take your Bible and uh, come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And go down to verse 58. Now, the last time I was with you on Sunday morning, we were just uh, taking it from, if you remember, 2 Timothy. Uh, And chapter 3 and verse 1 talks about uh, that there's something that we should know, that we're going to be persecuted, that we're not going to get it easy. The devil will kick us around as much as he can. Persecution is the lot of the Christian life. Uh, and, And we looked at that. And then we also went elsewhere, Philippians chapter 1, uh, where Paul says, I want you to understand. So just the idea that as believers, we should live with knowledge and understanding. So this morning, we just want to roll that wee boat out a wee bit further. And here's another little we know. And it's something God wants you folk here at Ballyhalbert to know. It says this. Therefore, my beloved brethren, I, uh, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. First Corinthians chapter 15 and 58. My beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And then it says this, for as much as you know. The question is, do you know this this morning? It is something you should know and never forget it. No matter what the work of the Lord looks like, no matter how it may seem, no matter how it goes, always know this, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Boy, there's sometimes you feel, <laughs> oh, Oh, the effort. And you've started on an enterprise, 2,000 leaflets around the doors. And it's not just this year. Think of all the other years around the same streets, the same doors, giving out similar leaflets, encouraging the people to come out. You're laboring in the Lord. Have you ever sort of sat down and thought of all the labor down the decades since this place was constructed, all the missions, the adults, all the missions for the children, all the uh, the campaigners, the girls, the boys, the gospel meetings, have you ever tried to figure out some sort of a way of, of, of coming to an understanding as to, 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 to quantify the labor, all oh, the labor in the Lord? And God wants you to know that all of that is not in vain. Can you turn to First Kings chapter 19? Because even the prophets of God can get to a place where they're so down and so downcast they really think it's all been in vain. It was a waste of time. The cause was and is lost. And it's strange because in chapter 18 he had a wonderful campaign of blessing. He was on a mountaintop. And he saw the glory of God and the power of God demonstrated in miraculous ways. He put the prophets of Baal, 4,000 of them, to the sword. He mocked the false gods of Baal. He had a wonderful time. But that was yesterday. And then today is a new day and somehow... It all seems like it's a different day uh, that, that God has died in between. Uh, God has uh, become invisible. He uh, is no more. Because here is chapter 19. And it simply says, And they have told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets of the sword. Uh, Jezebel wasn't there. Uh, but the news has come to her. And they Ahab, the husband, says, you won't believe this. On the mountain top there, Mount Carmel, uh, that, that, that Elijah fella, he took the sword and gold and so on, and, and, and all our prophets have been destroyed, and Elijah's to blame for it all. And she's angry. And she says, I'll get this guy, I'll get my revenge, and she's after him. 
It's amazing how an angry woman can put tremendous fear in a man. And here's this, this mighty prophet of God. He's reduced to being a shriveling moose. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Ahab, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Well, there's the message. And the message has got through. And the message, plain and simple, my eyes on you, I'm coming for you, you're going to pay for what you've done. And he's scared. Verse 4. And he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. And he came and he sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than any of my fathers. And he lay and he slept under the juniper tree. I tell you, he's in a bad way, isn't he? It's just like the day before never existed. It's like he was never on the mountain top. It's like he never saw the fire of God. It's like he never saw the power of God slaughter the prophets. This is a new day and this is the reality. Yes, it's just a blip. This is the everyday reality. It is all lost and he's down and he's suicidal. He's gone into isolation, the wilderness. You know, sometimes it's good to get alone for rest and quiet time, uh, but not to be anxious, not to get depressed, not to become all negative and defeatist and ready to throw in the towel and say, it is all over. No. It's okay to go into a wee bit of isolation in order to get your strength back. To get some sleep. To get some food. And isn't it amazing whenever, um, you see, what, 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 what's happening here is spiritual demoralization. And, and, and how he got there. He got there because of what came from Jezebel. Uh, the, 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 the triggered this, uh, it's almost like a, a, a spiritual breakdown. The anxiety was kicked off and, and began to think negative. And of course he's exhausted. He's gone a day's journey. Now of course I've gone a day's journey in many times. You have, um, you're sitting in the car, you've flown an airplane, you're in a train and so on. But a day's journey for the prophet of God wasn't on an airplane or a train or a car. It, it was, you know, he was walking it. Uh, he might throw himself in the back of a donkey or something, but uh, a day's journey and he's exhausted. Be careful when you get physically exhausted and you get all ragged and you've had no sleep, no decent food and, 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 and then something happens to the mind. The thinking process. What happens to the mind? Well, here's what he says. He says then the verse 4. We've read already. O oh Lord, take away my life for I am not better than my father's. He says, God, if I'm the best you have, you're in trouble. Like, there's not, a, not much about me. You know, listen, I, I, I'm all that's left. The, the nation has turned its back against you. There's nobody standing for you. There's nobody fighting for the cause. I'm all you have. And if I'm all, all that you have, God, you better throw in the towel. He is just so negative against himself. He's defeated. Uh, it's just a sad place to get to, isn't it? Psychologically, he's gone. Um, the, but, but he, here's the, how God got him back, you see. Uh, he, he, he allowed him to get a, get a sleep and then he baked him a cake and he brought him some to drink. And then he did the same thing again, put him back to sleep for a while and, and baking him another cake, a bit of breakfast, and then a, a wee bit more rest and so on. And, and then it's time to address the mind. 
Because if, if you believe that the cause is lost, why? Because there's nobody else standing. I, I'm General Custer, and the Indians are taking all that's around me, and, and I'm all that's left, so, uh, you know, the, 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 it is over. If that's the way you think, that's going to affect how you feel. That, that's going to make you say, Lord, uh, I'm sitting on the Jupiter tree now. I, I'm not interested in a cake or anything to drink. I just, take my life, please. So what does the Lord do? Well, he gives them nourishment. He addresses the physical exhaustion. But then he says in verse 18, he says, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal. He had to go through a wee period of re-education. Because sometimes you get yourself all uh, defeated you think that there's nothing happening, there's nothing going on, there's nothing being achieved. And uh, you think it's all a lost cause. God wants you to know your labor is not in vain. I remember, I think it was the very first mission you had me to come here uh, for the adult, it was the adult meeting, maybe that's what, about 15 years ago, whatever it was. And we were starting the meetings, began, the hiss was over there, and the, the way we were doing it, and, and the, the butcher, Davy Orr, and Davy looks out, and he sees this fella sitting there with an Afro hairstyle, you probably know who I'm talking about, big Afro, and, and Davy says, you let me tell you how that big fella got saved, and he told me the story. Uh, this big fella... Uh, was uh, up there in the UDA, UVF, and the lifestyle that went with that, the violence, the, the alcohol, the drugs, uh, the brutishness of it all. And of course he had a girlfriend, if I remember right, they had a little girl, and they lived together, and, and by this stage uh, his, his girlfriend was just getting tired of that way of life and just fed up with it all. And... The guy this Saturday afternoon was down in Corn Market walking through. And there's the wee men with the gospel leaflets, giving them out. Those wee men in all sorts of weather, uh, trying to keep a smile on their face and, and stay motivated in what were they facing. People maybe spitting in their face or taking the gospel track and ripping it up and throwing it down and stamping on it. All of that kind of response to their labor in the Lord. But this fellow was coming through and giving the little leaflet and he picked it up and uh, because if I understand the story right he had gospel in his background he just didn't have the heart to throw it in the ground or to rip it up or to, he just thought I'll stick it in the breast pocket of the jacket and he'll get rid of it later on on the way home he bumped into one of his colleagues who informed him uh, the, the top guys in the paramilitaries were after him because uh, uh, some of the money didn't tally and he was to blame for it and they were going to shoot him so uh, he was rather anxious. So he comes home. The girlfriend, the wee girl, they're gone and a note was simply left saying they're fed up and she left them and they're not coming back. And he was sort of tired of it all himself. Nothing to live for. He decided he was going to commit suicide. So, if I understand again, if I remember it right, he got himself a chair, he cut the jacket off, put it there, and then he got the, a rope and he tied the door handle up over the top of the door and, and where the chair was, and he'd stand in the chair and he put the rope around his neck. And, and then there came that horrific moment, he said, This is it. I'm putting an end to the misery. And he kicks the chair away. And of course the nooses around the neck and but as the chair hits the floor, the jacket's off the chair and out slides the wee gospel track. And in big bold print the heading was Eternity Where. Terrified him. As his eye caught it. He wasn't ending his misery. He was taking himself into the judgment of God. And he wanted to live. 
and whatever way he was able to do it, he was able to grab the hold of the rope and give himself a wee bit of freedom and get, and he saved his life and he headed off to Davy Orr's door and he knocked the door and Davy came and he says, Davy, I need to get saved. And Davy led him to the Lord. I often thought of those wee men down at Corn Market, wee gospel track, day in and day out and seeing them fruit in the rain stepped on and ripped up and so on and and many times I'm sure they must have thought of themselves maybe another day to head down it's raining out there should we bother does it matter Eh, does it matter Paul wants us to know your labour is not in vain it all counts Um, can I take you to Romans chapter 7 just for another little thing to know Romans chapter 7 and verse 18. And uh, we've got lots of evidence for this knowledge. Uh, It simply says, for I know uh, that in me. So something about ourselves we need to know. He says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. No good thing. That's a hard on a time to confront about yourself. You look at yourself in the mirror and, and, and to say, you, I'm looking beyond the preaching. I'm looking beyond the Sunday attire. I'm looking under the heart of the flesh. And when I look in there, I've come to this analysis, this conclusion, there's nothing good in there. It's flesh. And sometimes that knowledge leads us to cry out in verse 24, O wretched man that I am. Eh, What do you do yourself when you know that there's nothing good inside of you? When you want to do good, at the end of the day, you don't find a power to do it. And there's an evil there you don't want to get involved in, but then by the end of the day, you're involved in it. That's why you cry out, O wretched man that I am. What a failure. Well, let me show you a wretched man. Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, and verse 33. And this wretched man is, uh, is Peter. And it says here in verse 33, uh, And Peter said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both uh, under prison, or into prison, and to death. He says, I'm ready to sacrifice my life for you. If they arrest you, they'll have to arrest me. And if they put you in jail, I'll be in jail with you. If they need you to a cross, I'll be in the cross beside you. What a, a, a fantastic advertisement. Eh? That's some advertisement. But I remember when um, my son Ben, and he as a, a wee boy, all these t- things were coming out, Mario, the, the computers and stuff, and of course, uh, all the kids were waiting for the, uh, the, 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 the latest release of the next big, you know. And Argus were advertising. We have it now, come and get it. And Ben says, Daddy, we've got to go to Argus. And I want to get this. I've got to get my friends. I've got it. I got it. And the advertisement. So he wore me down and off we went to get Mario. And when we got there, we went up and asked for Mario and the apologies were there we're very 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 sorry um, we, we, we put a request for stock in but we didn't get any we have nothing in stock so here was some advertising come and get it but when you arrive there and you say I want to get it I'm sorry we advertised it but it's not in stock it's like a check that bounced. And Peter, eh, that sounds good, you know. And it makes the other disciples feel, you know. I'm not much of a disciple compared to Peter. <laughs> Don't think I could say, Jesus, I will go to jail with you, or I could, I'd be prepared to die for you, but there's Peter, and, and he's put it out there, and, you know, but was it real? Was it substantive? Was it just an empty? An advertisement of something that didn't exist. 
Well, that's what he said. Look what it says in uh, verse 54. The last we phrase simply says, and Peter followed to fall off. So he's, uh, he's not heading the direction of the prison cell or Calvary's mountain. He's going the opposite direction. Uh, and then it says, and when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down, Peter sat down among them. And a certain maid beheld him uh, as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him. It's uncomfortable when you know that somebody's staring at you. But she saw that face and she's thinking, I know that man. Where have I seen him before? She's trying to figure it out. And then a wee light goes on in her mind. I have got it. The penny drops. I know you. Are you not one of that man's disciples? Eh? So, the time is now to come forth. Let the courage declare itself. And I am the man, you know. Uh, verse 57. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. Now look at verse 62. This is what we better want you to get. This is the cry out of a wretched man. And Peter, he went out, and he wept bitterly. And you see the word bitter? Oh, it's not just saying there's lots of salty tears there. Uh, the, the, the word is violently. You look at this man crying, and you think, my goodness, keep your, I wouldn't want to get too close to him. There's something going on here. There's a man beside himself. There's a man's hands are clenched into fists. He's, he's punching his head. He's beating his breast. He's angry. Or not the wee girl that exposed him. He's angry at himself. He got a picture of himself. He hates himself. His rage is against himself. I'm a wretched man. I'm a coward. I'm a weakling of a mouse. I'm a nobody. You see, the victory the devil had over Peter was not when he said to the wee girl, I know him not. It's when he said to the disciples later on, he says, I'm going back fishing. He says, I'm finished with Christianity. I'm finished with Jesus. I'm going to go and do something I'm familiar with, that I'm good at, I can fish. I'm not very good at being a disciple. That's when the devil wrung his hands and says, I got him. I got him to the stage where he hated himself so much. He turned his back upon the Lord. See, every time you look into yourself, you're going to find some reason in there to cry out, I'm a wretched man. Yeah. And if at that time you see the wretchedness, and you feel the wretchedness, and you've a temptation, to, I'm finished with Christianity, that's the devil's victory. You see those moments when you look inside and you see the wretched man. Here's where you need to lift your eyes. Lift your eyes to Calvary. See the Lord Jesus die for your sins and die for all your failure. And then remember, the Lord Jesus is your righteousness. The Lord Jesus is your acceptance. You'll never look into yourself and see something in there worthy of righteousness before God. That'll be self-righteousness and that's an abomination. Always say yes, your own failure. But then look to the cross. Jesus died for my shame. He died for my failure. And the Lord Jesus, he's my righteousness before God. And I stand in him. So yes, know that your labor is not in vain. Know that in you there is no good thing. But remember that all your righteousness is found in Christ. Let's close we were a prayer. Father, we thank you for the work of the Lord. And the world today is a harder place to serve you than it's ever been probably in any of our lives, lifetimes. Where the gospel is now pushed to the fringe and we're made to feel embarrassed for it that 
It's no longer accepted in our culture. But our Father, we soldier on. We declare this glorious message, the only message in mankind to save the soul and to cleanse sin. And our Father, we pray for the mission that starts tonight and we pray indeed that uh, as we labour in the gospel, night after night, that indeed there may be those who will come with a, not just come to please somebody, but maybe with a wee desire born in their heart that they want something more in this life than what the world has to offer. That they might want the Lord Jesus Christ as their Saviour to know their sins forgiven and that heaven is their eternal home. And our Father, we bless you that that in Christ we have the forgiveness of our sins and our righteousness with God. Father, help us when we do look inside ourselves and see nothing worthy of praise that will not stay focused there. We'll shift our focus to a crucified Saviour and reckon in him is our righteousness before the Father. These things we ask in our Saviour's precious name. Amen. God bless you.